Thank you, Barbara, for the opportunity to be at Wood Library and to talk to you about a subject very near and dear to me, uh, our Vietnam veterans, and I call them my guys. Let me know if you're not able to hear me in the back. I made some remarks at uh, the Delaware General Assembly uh, in May. They had invited me to come up and talk, and I did, and I'd like to share those with you, and then quickly we will segue right into the letters, the, the words from our servicemen from Vietnam. No more compelling accounts of the contentious Vietnam War exist than in correspondence from our Delaware servicemen on the front lines. As a columnist with the News Journal papers in Wilmington, Delaware, I received nearly 900 letters and hundreds of images from the combat zone for Nancy's Vietnam mailbag, which you saw right there, from 1968 to 1972, five years. Our men and women gifted us with a unique window on that undeclared and unpopular war. As we got to know our troops during those five years, we marveled at their buoyancy, self-sufficiency, and confidence at danger's door. Unselfishly, they airmailed their unvarnished, war-torn, homesick selves to us week after week. Between the lines, we read their apprehension and fear, and yes, optimism and hope. Despite the grimness of battle, they found time to express wit and humor and gladly shared with us at home their zest for life in the face of death. They made us proud to know them. In Vietnam Mailbag, Voices from the War, 1968 to 1972, which I released on Veterans Day, uh, last Veterans Day of 08, we salute all Vietnam veterans and especially the authors of these exemplary war letters that transcend generations with their timeless relevancy and enduring spirit. Publishing this book, their story, your story, and an important social history really fulfills a promise I made to my guys, I call them, in my last column in December of 1972. I have since donated all their correspondence and pictures, as we were saying, perhaps the largest collection of primary source material still in existence from this five-year period to the Delaware Public Archives for safekeeping so future generations may know their voices. Let's travel back in time, and I mean really travel, 41 years ago. I know, we're all shaking our heads. <laughs> well, almost all of us. Uh, <laughs> to 1968, uh, that's where the book begins. May 20th uh, of 1968 was my very first column that was published. And we set the stage uh, in the book for that period of time. Americans protested the undeclared war in Vietnam, raged at the assassinations of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy, and thumbed the establishment with draft card burnings. The national mood soured on the endless and seemingly unwinnable war in Vietnam, 12,000 miles distant yet telecast into millions of living rooms each evening on the 6 o'clock news. In 1968, its deadliest year, the undeclared war claimed the lives of 16,592 American forces. Five days after King was killed, rioters in Wilmington, Delaware's West Center City like many other cities in the country, burned buildings, looted businesses, and lobbed firebombs at city police. Wilmington Mayor John E. Babiar Sr. called for the National Guard. Governor Charles L. Terry Jr. did not hesitate. Although order was restored in a few days, the city was placed under curfew until April 14th. Babiar's canceled the state of emergency on May 2nd. 
but Terry, the governor, refused to halt the guards' jeep patrols. And I'm reading this section because you will see pictures in our DVD of the National Guard in Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington was the only municipality in the country with militia on active duty. Not until political newcomer Russell W. Peterson, a Republican and former DuPont Company chemist, narrowly defeated Terry and was inaugurated governor on January 21, 1969, nearly a year later, was the guard removed from Wilmington. Peterson's first official act ended the longest military occupation of a U.S. city since the Civil War. It also ended a national embarrassment. So it was in this climate that I started receiving letters from our servicemen in Vietnam. And I will be quoting. Now my gripe is I received the morning news from you and on the front page was a picture of police pushing back rioters and a story of snipers and riots all over Delaware. Could anyone in the States realize how depressing that is? To think I'm in Vietnam fighting and my National Guard friend who joined to get out of fighting is fighting. That's quite a joke to me. Up until now, I used to think it would be really great to return to a world of peace and nonviolence. But now, it seems when I finish my tour over here, I will return to almost the same thing as what I'm doing here. I wish people would realize there's enough trouble and turmoil in the world without causing more. In closing, I would also like to say, may I never meet or hear of anyone burning their draft card or defecting to another country. Though my views on Vietnam are not 100% pro, I am an American and I am fighting for my country. Army Sergeant Jerry Thompson, May 7th. We heard lots more gripes. As for my gripes, well, I don't have the paper to list them all, but here are a few. Sand, rain, no girls, the food, the working hours, no girls, the pay, no girls, and above all, the demonstrations and rioting that are going on back in the United States. I realize that it is a minority, but that is all I ever read about in the Stars and Stripes. I just wish all those hippies and yippies knew just how good they have it in the good old USA. If they could spend a couple of months over here, I'm sure they would change their outlook 180 degrees. Marine Corporal Scott Price in July, September 27th. I would like to tell you about the Army, but my father always told me, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say it. That was the whole letter. Army Specialist William R. Lilly. <laughs> June 17th, mailbag. They made us laugh, too. <coughs> we were proud of our servicemen's commitment to their country. This is my second tour in Vietnam, and I keep trying to tell myself the reason I am here is to keep those children of mine from having to go through what I am now. Captain Anthony P. D. Bendetto, April 29th. As much as I would love to go home, and along with all of the bad things of a war, I am proud to be an American. I am proud to serve my country, defend it, and fight for the cause of peace. I think that has been my greatest achievement, to find out just how wonderful it is to be an American. Army PFC Bruce W. Bisco, May 1st. The war, in my opinion, is for a cause that is, to free countries of communist control and let them have a safe and democratic life. I was born in the USA, so I will fight and die for my country. It's as simple as that. Navy Seaman Al Temple at the DMZ, September 17th. Mailbag readers held their breath with this battle narrative. 
Right now, we are as close to an attack as possible. All it will take is one second of that siren to have us all in the bunker. A battle has been raging outside our perimeter all day. As we put it, there are Boku VC out there, all trying to get in. Last night, they hit Phuc Van, Tom Sunud Air Base, Loy Ki, Kuchi, and Saigon. There was a little <coughs> damage done. Fu Loy wasn't hit, but we all said we were next. I guess we are. Right now, some of us medics are out on the resupply line and in various areas to check for casualties. The rest of us are sitting in the dispensary, waiting. There is a card game in progress and nervous laughter. Somebody has their tape recording recorder on, low enough to hear the siren over it. The outside noises are intense. We hear the thrump of mortars and the firing of rockets and heavy artillery. The most reassuring sound is the beat of a copter's blades and the staccato of a gunship. More so is the deafening sound of a jet making a low pass outside the perimeter. Tonight, my hopes are for the grunts, the infantry. They have formed their own wall, a human perimeter, that separates our bunker line and the VC. All of this is about a mile from us. We have our secondary bunker line man too, just in case. All we can do now is sit here and wait. It is up to Charlie now. We are ready. <coughs> the card game pauses each time there is a series of loud explosions. Are they ours or theirs? Coming in or going out? The guy with the tape recorder pauses, then returns to his music. The game progresses. We have some new guys here. To us, they are green. They are the ones already in the bunker, sitting extremely quiet. We laugh to ourselves, for we know we did the same thing once. We know, too, that after a while, they will change. They will learn the difference between an outgoing and an incoming round. There is a definite sound difference. They're probably thinking we're out of our minds for acting so calm, but they will learn. Nobody is calm now. However, it is reassuring to each other to look this way. We do things like write letters. If you get this letter, we are all right. We do things that are really silly. Some of us who have tape recorders, especially now, put them under desks for protection. It is about 8.30 now. I'm going to try to get a few winks of sleep. Tonight will be a long, long one. Army Specialist Philip D. Johnson in Fuloy, April 5th. Our readers learned about camaraderie. My job with Charlie Company is platoon radio man, but that is apt to change, as there is a constant reshuffling of men and changing of jobs. We are currently situated at Landing Zone Stud, just between the Rock Pile and Kalu. This is our jumping off point for our seemingly endless operations. We are completing an operation now which took us across the Ben Hai River and into the North Vietnam, North Vietnam side of the DMZ. Ours was the first outfit to penetrate this far north so we have something on the rest of the 9th Marines. The men of Charlie Company are really an outstanding group of guys. I guess the average age is about 19. I'm 20. But yet our work is definitely man-sized. Despite the fact that we get very little rest and go on op after op, the morale <coughs> is still high. It's rather a difficult thing to explain, but I suppose we of Charlie 1-9 have what they call plenty of esprit de corps. In a place where you're warned not to become too close to a buddy because he or you can be killed at any time, it's impossible not to develop friendships that go beyond just being friends. When you eat, sleep, fight, etc. alongside a guy, the word friend seems a bit insufficient. I think perhaps that instead of being buddies, we are more like brothers. Marine Lance Corporal Gary D. Chastain, 
at Landing Zone Stud, September 21st. We heard opposing opinions on the war. An army officer at Quang Tree had been wounded about a month before writing this letter. I'm an armed helicopter pilot with A Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry. I feel as though I'm doing a worthwhile job over here. I've seen many a friend go down in flames, and I've seen many a foot soldier killed or maimed by the enemy. Back home, we hear about the Saigon warrior, whose biggest day was the Tet Offensive. True, it was rough, but it wasn't year-round. The soldier in the field has it all year-round, and he gets little thanks for it. He doesn't have movies, or Cokes, or continuous mail service. He doesn't get to see the Bob Hope Show, or other specials over here. I feel the work here is for a worthy cause. At times, it appears the South Vietnamese aren't too sure they want to pay the price for freedom. I have seen some Arvin units withdraw from an enemy force much smaller than their own, and other times, I have seen Arvin units hold their own when confronted with quite formidable odds. With better guidance and some patience, I'm sure the Vietnamese army will come of its own, just as the South Korean army was able to do. If the people are given a chance to decide for themselves, I'm sure we'd have a staunch ally here in Southeast Asia. Army Captain Michael Momsilovich, Jr., May 4th. Captain Momsilovich, 24, who graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1965, was killed a day after writing to the mailbag when the Cobra helicopter he was flying was shot down by hostile gunfire. The 56th Delawarean to die in Vietnam, Captain Monsilovich was one of 187 U.S. troops killed on May 5th, the date America sustained the most casualties in a single day during the entire war. And as an aside, Captain Monsilovich's family has confirmed to me that this was the last letter he ever wrote. A Marine was skeptical about the war. Hi, I guess that's a good way to start this letter. I really don't know what to say. My name is Corporal Ron Bleacher. I lived in Wilmington and Ellesmere all my life. I won't say how long I've been in Vietnam, I'll just tell you I have 44 days left. I am with Hotel Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines at Anwa. I saw your article with Corporal John Caro. About 10 minutes ago, I was just talking to him. We've been out in the field now for 27 days, and his company was just choppered into our area. We both talked for about 20 minutes before he left. He told me to write. Myself, I really don't think we should be over here. Two of my best friends were killed over here. For what? These ungrateful people? This country? If this is what they died for, it isn't a hell of a lot. He told me what to say what I thought, so I am. All I want to know is for what or why. I'm just glad I'm getting out of here. Marine Corporal. Ron T. Bleacher, September 8th. Three weeks later, on September 29th, Corporal Bleacher was shot and killed by enemy gunfire during a military operation. He was 19. His last letter appeared in the September 30th mailbag, a day after his death. Even though these letters are from Delaware servicemen, we can all relate and we can easily see the relevancy of these letters fast forward to today. There's, that's, that's a, whole nother, a whole nother issue, but it doesn't get any realer than those letters. And that's why I decided to 
donate all of them to the Delaware Public Archives. These letters are treasures. They're pieces of history that need to be preserved. Succeeding generations need to know what it was like and just what our men went through. And we all know as a country, we did not treat our Vietnam veterans well. When you, and I'm speaking to Jeff, and I'm sorry I don't know your first name, but Joe. Joe? to Jeff and Joe and tens of thousands of other Vietnam veterans well when they returned home. And you guys, and I'm speaking directly to you, were willing to put your lives on the line 24-7. in all these intervening years. Um, what they're doing today, even how they feel about Iraq and Afghanistan, another undeclared war of undetermined length, where the ally looks like the enemy. It's, there are so many parallels. So, and as I say, it was just such an honor to be able to, to, do, to catch up with them. And a lot of these guys, you, you'll notice in the, in the video, there was the guy with the John Lennon glasses, with the, you know, doing the peace sign. Well, I knew the names of everybody because we had corresponded one-on-one. -on -one. I wouldn't necessarily know what they looked like unless they sent a picture. So when we released the book on Veterans Day, the archives gave a statewide reception in Dover, Delaware, the capital, and this great big bear of a guy came up to me, gave me a big hug, and said, oh, so glad to see you. And I said, okay, what's your name? <laughs> and he said, Harry Porter. I said, Harry, if you had just done this, <laughs> I would have known who you were. <laughs> but so many wonderful, wonderful encounters, sometimes random, sometimes not, have occurred. And as soon as they say their names, I mean, these are my guys, and I know. So what have we been doing with the book since last Veterans Day? We're trying to make it a national read. Yes, Delaware Project, but as you heard their words, their voices, they resonate throughout the country. We feel very strongly about that. In May, this little gold sticker here, and I hope I gave you one if I, okay. <laughs> it's official now, this book uh, was, judged best nonfiction in the mid-Atlantic, which is six states and Washington, D.C. So we're getting some traction. We're getting along our way. I published this book myself, which makes me an independent publisher, which is where this award comes from. And it's a tough slog because most people, most authors maybe have an agent or you know, a book distributor. I don't. I'm going you know, library by library. I'm, I'm telling the story. I am just a facilitator. This is your story, in your words, and your pictures. But it needs to be told, and I'm going to tell it. So I have uh, two names that I'd like to drop in, in the pursuit of a national um, quest for recognition for you guys. One is Oprah. Uh, I did send a book to her. I keep hearing from her staff, and she, the staff, says, be patient, I can be patient. I don't know what that means, but you know, five seconds with her, we'd have a national read. I mean, it just, that's just the way that works, so. But we're being very patient. Um, but I won't go on her show without a veteran on side by side, because that's how strongly I feel about that. This is, this is your, your book and your story. Second name I'll drop is Ken Burns, uh, the filmmaker, who's very much in the news now because of national parks. And I sent Ken a book uh, because I feel our next step is a documentary of some sort. So Ken wrote back a personal letter, which you can imagine how busy he is, and apologized really for taking so long to write back. But that's okay, I forgave him. And he said, um, was very complimentary about the book, and then said, by the way, um, I would be honored, his word, to use your book in my upcoming Vietnam film. Well, that did two things. First of all, it made me feel really, really good. But second of all, it confirmed for the very first time that he will be doing, you know, he did the World War II movie, that he will be doing a, a movie, a film on Vietnam. 
He said it's a couple of years down the road because he's juggling three or four projects, one of which we know is the National Parks. So stay tuned on that. I have a feeling you're going to be hearing about this book. And my next mission is to get as many of my guys uh, in that film as possible. As I said when I read the letters, it doesn't get any realer than this. He wants experiences, he wants letters and memorabilia, whatever. We've, we've got it all. So. And part of what I do when I do these talks, um, I have a little campaign that I'm trying to promote, and I'll, I'll just wrap this up, and please, if you have questions, I, I, we'll keep it informal. I really, it's, it's a simple campaign, anybody can do it. I call it five in five. Five words in five seconds. Thank you for your service. Doesn't take any time, doesn't cost anything, Everybody ought to be doing that to the veterans that we know of any war, but in particular, our, our Vietnam War. And if five seconds is too much out of your day, too much time, try two and two. Welcome home. And you just might make a Veterans Day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Wow. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Barbara, for doing the DVD. It's a bit challenging. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Barbara, we went, had one run through, and she knew exactly where to start and stop. So, uh, did you get uh, mail from the women? Yes, yes, we we do have women in there. We didn't get any letters until 1969, one year into the column. But we heard from Army nurses, um, Red Cross, <coughs> USO, and their letters and pictures are in the book as well. We wish we would have heard from more of them and. The dozen interviews I did at the end um, are all guys, and you know maybe if we go into a second printing, we will need to put a gal or two in there just for the just for the record. So, but good question. Yes, there were women there. Obviously not on the front lines; they couldn't be, but they were there and they were working hard. Cool. And, and you have? <laughs> do you know that? They were pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> absolutely. So. Any other? Any other questions? Yeah, a quick one. You saw a lot of children and no adults around. Were those all orphans? Orphans, yes. Paper. Yes. They had, and you notice most of the clothes look somewhat American, mm -hmm. donated clothing. Pacification was really the other war that was going on in Vietnam then, and that was an attempt to help the South Vietnamese who so many died and so many children were left as orphans and even in some of the pictures orphans taking care of orphans mm -hmm. it, yes what happened to them was anybody in charge of them at all there was uh, where i was stationed just outside our base camp there there was a the village and there was an orphanage there i think it was run by some uh, nuns in the village. We used to go there fairly frequently for a while. We used to take our laundry there, uh -huh. have them wash it, but then we quit doing that because it came back smelling worse than when they bought it. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, but yeah, it, it kind of struck enough clothes. We used to bring clothes and you know, candy and other things. It was, it was kind of rough to see that. Well, one of the nurses, uh, Army, Army nurses, wrote to the column, and she was at 93rd Evacuation Hospital, Long Bin, and she <coughs> asked for, actually she made an appeal through the column for the people in our community to gather up Christmas-type items uh, and gifts and whatever could for the men on her ward. She wanted them, otherwise they wouldn't have a very happy Christmas so far away from home. So um, we put out the appeal and we were able to send, uh, through the generosity of uh, back then when there was an F.W. Woolworths, remember that mm -hmm. <laughs> store? Mm -hmm. And other stores like that, eight boxes, huge boxes, full of decorations and gifts and candy and all kinds of things. And Valerie, the nurse, not only wrote back, she sent pictures back of, you know, the little 
um, tabletop trees and everything that decorated her work. She was so grateful. And her letters in the book and, and pictures and all. And she just said, you know, my guys are having a, a happier Christmas than they would given where they are. Um, but thanks to you all at home. But it was this kind of, of goodwill that you know, we were able to generate. And the column also, we didn't start out this way, didn't intend this, but uh, we were responsible for three engagements. Mm. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Only because I would encourage, I, not encourage, I would really just prod our readers at home Take five minutes out of your day. Write to our guys. We published full military addresses. There was no reason not to write. And I would just, you know, be on their case all the time. And uh, three times that uh, turned into a little more than pen pal. So, and that's not the way we started out. That was kind of fun. We would publish uh, births of children, anniversaries, birthdays. And families at home, they, they let us in on a lot of the secrets too. So uh, whenever we could, we tried to make it as user-friendly, the column, and so that both readers at home obviously would have that wonderful experience of hearing firsthand from, you know, their brothers and husbands and uncles and friends and neighbors and so forth, what was going on in the war. Um, they would, it would just be real. We would make it real, both ways, actually. So that's what we were trying to do. Was there anything that sometimes you weren't allowed to print? No, good question. Never did my editors ever censor a letter. And the government didn't either? Or the letters just wouldn't come if they had stuff in them that the government felt? Well, I'm, I guess better. not because I, I I never got them. I mean, I got letters with patches in them and, and None pictures. None of them had these big black things across words. No. No. Nothing like that. No. All the letters I got were, were good to go. My editors never censored, censored them. Uh, they're not censored in the book. I mean, no. The only thing we did in the book, if there were some misspellings or whatever, I mean, we're putting our guys front and center, you know, and we, we want them, want their words to be as good as possible. So, but nothing really was changed. It's as it came from Vietnam. So, and I received, uh, let's see. I was on a, a radio show in, in Wilmington talking about the book, and, and the commentator said, well, what was the strangest thing you ever received in a letter? And I said, sand. <laughs> <laughs> From the beaches of Da Nang, which supposedly had some of the best beaches in the country. And Vietnam is a beautiful country. <coughs> I can find pictures when I want to, but the last guy you saw in the contemporary interview um, Ken Warner. He was a dust off the helicopter ambulance pilot. Well, he was in the air all the time. This is just an example. Mm -hmm. um, this is in northern northern Vietnam. But he came forward when he found out we were doing the project. And of course, he knew we were doing it because I interviewed him. But he found more pictures. Originally, this book was supposed to be released Memorial Day of last year. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, but. The guys came forward with so much more in the way of pictures, illustrations. Um, we said we can't, we can't be ready in time. We were really kind of uh, concerned about that, and then we thought, let's not worry about it. We're going to do this once. We're going to do it right, and we're, this is to honor all Vietnam veterans. <coughs> so we're going to hold it for uh, Veterans Day. That's what we did, and the book is better for it. I'm glad we did. It was a hard decision, though. When they gave you uh, contributed materials, did they know they were destined for the state archives? <laughs> or did that no. come later? No, I didn't know they were. I want you to know. I've known Nancy a long time. And I lived in Delaware before I moved around to some more. This stuff sat in her barn for how many years, Nancy? Oh, 20 years. 20 years. She talked about it, and it just sat there, and she says, someday I want to do something about this. And finally she did, and it's a gift, and she's so gifted to do it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's a wonder, really, the other side of that story. Now, the state archivist 
in Delaware. I mean, I told him that those letters had been in a barn for 20 years, and he turned about 20 shades and pale. <laughs> and he just, oh my gosh, you know, this is horrible. How could you do this? But I went in the barn when I was, and why do things happen? I don't know. Why was I just led to the barn? And I thought, I wonder how those letters are doing. And a great big, remember Tandy Computers, the first <laughs> great big box full of all the letters. The only thing I had to remove was a mouse nest. No mouse, but just the nest. Every, almost, I think there was one letter that I lost. Every single letter in there. Well, you saw the envelopes on the board. It looks like they were written last week. Now tell me why. In a barn. No climate control. The hottest of hots, the coldest of colds. Even the pictures were not, did not stick to the paper and uh, the letters. The wettest of wet. The wet of the humidity. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Delaware is you know, notorious for that. It was meant to be. That's all I can say. I, there's things I can't explain to this day. Never will be able to. But it uh, it all worked out and. Uh, Could I ask you one more question, Nancy? Of course. And the, the numbers, when you were playing the, uh, the pictures, uh, some were late uh, from Vietnam, some were current, and you had <coughs> dates up where, were those the dates of service, or did yes. that mean that the, the man had died? No, 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 no. I and I should have explained that. Most of those were just one year, mm -hmm. um, and it was the year tour, okay. the, the one year tour uh, in Vietnam. And, you know, that was just a, a design feature, so. That's what that meant. No, these guys. Well, I, I'm sad to say that one, Bob Cohen, died this summer. And when you read his story, um, he actually, he was Army, uh, parachuting mailman. Now, figure that out. Actually, uh, what it was, um, he would parachute into fire bases, landing zones, you know, way out in the boonies to pick up the checks after the guys had been paid and take them back and deposit the, I mean, send them home or whatever they did with them, but otherwise the money would just collect and that's not what, uh, what he wanted to do. Anyway, Bob, Bob's story, um, talk about roads not traveled. Bob was, here he is, a standout baseball pitcher in high school. He was scouted by the um, Pittsburgh Pirates and the Cincinnati Reds. When he was in high school, here's Bob. Mm -hmm. And the same, uh, after he graduated from high school, the same week he got his letter to actually try out, I think it was with the Pirates, and this wasn't a field, a farm team, this was the real deal, mm -hmm. try out. He was a big guy, you know, 6'3", anyway, big strapping guy. He got his draft notice from the Marines. And typical of Bob, he, has, he had the greatest sense of humor. He said, well, you know, I thought I was enough of a man. I didn't need to join the Marines, so I enlisted in the Army. <laughs> Aren't you guys <laughs> glad to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> he did, and he did his one-year tour, came home, went on about his life, didn't think about anything. One day, he was having trouble, aches and pains in his left knee, and went to the VA to, you know, figure out what it was. And they told him that it was bone deterioration from Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. This was 30 some years after the war. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was just a you know distant memory. And they gave him a choice. They said, you can walk around with this, this light's gonna go out on you anytime, or you can have it amputated. You decide. So he made the that awful wrenching decision to have the leg amputated because it, the, the other leg was fine, but it was this one, and they have, the VA documented that it was Agent Orange. And can you imagine? And I'm sure that, you know, his death this last summer was from complications, you know, over time of, from Agent Orange. So, very sad. Are there any other states that have similar books, collections of Vietnam primary material. Not that we know of. We because we don't know of any other state that had a columnist that was writing to in fact I had a call from a lady from New York, somewhere in New York, and she said, Well, can you tell me who wrote the book on the New York servicemen and their letters? And it's like, No, I can't <laughs> because I don't know of any other book like this. And 
Yeah. There was a fellow, uh, Ray Wager, Wager, I'm not sure if I'm oh, saying yeah. it right, mm -hmm. in this community who a few years ago was working with the VA and he wasn't collecting letters from that period, but he was interviewing vets from any war period who wanted to be have an oral history done. And I invited him to come tonight, but I, I haven't seen him around in a while, so maybe he's gone south. <laughs> Would have liked to have met him, so maybe uh, I will sometime. Did you guys write letters? Do you have collections that you've kept and photos? Um, I've got pictures, uh, letters sent to my parents mostly. Mm -hmm. I haven't really checked with them to see. I used to, I, when I was over there, I was, I guess, writing kind of like poetry too. Like a, for me it was like a catharsis, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't, I, I don't have those now. But I, you should gather them all together. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How about you? Did you write that? I've got one letter I found after my mother passed away. That she had kept? She had kept. No. <laughs> I still have it. Great. Every once in a while I look at it. Huh. I don't know if you want to see it. Huh? Well, those are treasures. I mean, they're time capsules. And as I was reading that, the letters aren't right or wrong. It's whatever the serviceman felt on that particular day and, you know, elected to share with, with readers back home. Um, they're just so special. Andrew Carroll, who is the editor of the book, you might have heard of it, War Letters, um, he gave the book, my, my book, a very glowing endorsement. He has a project. It's called the War Letter Project. And, yeah, maybe you've heard of it all. What he would like to do is preserve as many war letters, all wars, um, as possible. He doesn't want the original letters. He wants copies of the original letters, and then he stores them. And I have put a plea in, the, uh, in my book for anybody who has war letters to consider, and an address, where to send copies of the letters so that they can be preserved. You know, and I get questions a lot, well, are you going to do a similar book on, you know, for today's wars? And it's like, I don't think so, because so much of the correspondence today, I mean, it's texting and it's emails and it's all electronic and it, it's gone. I mean, unless somebody downloads it and prints it out, so much of it is, is really lost today. To, today's war, wars, are so very different in some ways from Vietnam. Or they're doing it uh, by video with Skype. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, you don't, they don't record it, it's gone. That's right. When the call's done. That's right. Yeah. Well, notice in the, within the letters, weren't they well written? <coughs> I, I was just amazed at how, I mean, and these are 19, 20 year old guys who really, you know, Guys are not known for one writing letters, or you know, two being all that careful about what how they say things. These letters are great, really, and I think that's a, a credit, a real credit to them. You didn't change anything, did you? Absolutely not. No, it wouldn't be primary source material if I did. So, I mean, like I say, spelling corrections, maybe a few grammatical, you know, commas, things like that. No. So the men you uh, did contemporary interviews with, um, what did they think about the project and that their letters and thought, pri maybe, in some, well, they weren't private thoughts because they were published. No, and they knew going in yeah. that their letters would be published in yeah. a newspaper. Yeah. So they knew that those letters actually were um, public but, record. But now they're being brought out from their youth. <laughs> How, how did they the feel guys, about that? A few of the guys were, I would say, across the board, they were enthusiastic and really, except for Ken Warner, the helicopter ambulance pilot. He said, you know, I haven't talked about Vietnam, and I'm sure you guys can relate. It's not something, you know, Vietnam was a bad word when, when you guys came home. He said, I'm not sure I want to do this. I said, well, I, I go ahead. Um, have you gone to VA and uh, tried to find uh, veterans and uh, their letters? No. No. I have such a, a wealth of material with the nearly 1,000 letters that I have that, that I hadn't done that. Okay. 
But the Ken Warner that I was talking about, he, um, he wasn't at all sure that he wanted to do the interview. And I said, Ken, I respect that. I mean, let me know. Think about it, and if you want to, fine. A lot of the guys had trouble talking about certain parts, and we'd have to stop, and they'd take a minute, and, or, you know, we'd come back to it, and maybe another day, even. But they wanted to get it out. They said, I, I need to finish this. I want to talk about this. You know, initially, maybe some, a few were reluctant, but then once they got going, it's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that in 40 years, or, yeah, I remember that, or this, this, this part's hard for me, or what? so honest, and that's what comes through in, in all their letters.